today we are turning our hearts back into our series. We're in a series called Infinite and Intimate. This infinite, almighty God who created and sustains this universe is also the infinitely intimate to God who knows the numbers of hairs on our head. He knows us by name. He knows us because he loves us. And he is an infinitely massive God who has an infinitely small or an intimately small perspective of you and I. He's up close and he's personal. Today, um, I am pleased to tell you that you don't have to listen to my voice teach today. I have asked someone come to come and teach because um, there are few people in the world who have taught me the value of scripture, like my professor from Western Seminary, Tim Brown. He taught me what it was to prize scripture and to hide it in your heart. And we are wrestling with the question today of intimate and infinite of why, why should we read the Bible and how do we do it and what's the point of it? And I think it's important to understand that the word of God is not something just to be read, but it's something to take in. And I guarantee you this, if we were to take a knife and cut Tim Brown open this morning, scripture would fall out. I have not met a person in my life who knows the word of God quite like Tim does, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to him and have you here and sit under his teaching the way I was privileged to do so. So would you welcome with me Dr. Tim Brown? Really nice. Thank you, Eric. That was really nice, but I wish you wouldn't have stopped. <laughs> Honestly, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Tim Brown. I teach preaching at Western Seminary, and I'm the president, and I am a charter member of the Eric Folkers fan club. Eric, oh my goodness, he's like a lightning bolt in a Coke bottle. Uh, he's, like, he's like a five-hour energy drink with skin on. It's just amazing. Does he ever stop? Erica, wherever you are, you have our Christian sympathies. I'm eager to get down to business. I'm going to tell you um, a fairly longish story from the Bible. I promise I'm not going to make up a single word. Every word you hear is going to be right out of the Bible. And at the end of it, if it works its magic in you like it does in me, it'll, it'll prompt you to love Jesus. Maybe for the first time, if you don't love him now, or make you love him again if you've loved him before. It's an amazing story. But I want to look at that story through a particular set of, uh, a particular lens. And it's this lens at the end of the Bible, Revelation 21, verse 5. Jesus said, see, I am making all things new. I mean, that's like a bold claim. I am making all things new. Can you, can you really pull that off, Jesus? Well, let's, let's see if he can pull that off as I tell you still another story um, that I find amazing. Before I tell you that story, pray with me, please. Father, may your word be our rule your spirit, our teacher, and the glory of Jesus, our only concern, in whose name we pray, amen. Now, a certain man named Lazarus was ill. Lazarus is from the village of Bethany, where Martha and Mary live. Mary is the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with costly perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus saying, Rabbi, the one whom you love is ill. Now, when Jesus received this message, he said to his disciples, this sickness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Now, accordingly, though Jesus loved Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, he remained where he was for two more days. 
Then he said to his disciples, come, let us go again to Judea. The disciples said to Jesus, Rabbi, the Jews were just now about to kill you, and would you return there? Jesus said, are there not, are there not 12 hours in the day? Those who walk in the light neither stumble nor fall because they have the light of the world. Those who walk at night stumble and fall, and there is no light in them. Our brother Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm going to wake him up. One of the disciples said to Jesus, well, if he's sleeping, he'll be all right. Now, Jesus was referring to Lazarus' death. The disciple thought he meant he was merely sleeping. Then Jesus spoke plainly to them. Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you might see the glory of God and believe. Then he said, come, let us go. Thomas, who was called the twin, said, let us go with him, even if we die with him. Now, as Jesus was drawing near Bethany, which was about two miles outside of Jerusalem, Martha heard that Jesus was coming, so she got up and ran to him. And when she got to the place where he was, she said to him, Rabbi, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, Martha, your brother will live again. I, I know, I know, in the resurrection on the last day, Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Martha said, yes, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Now, when, when Martha had said this, she turned and ran back to her sister Mary and said to her, Mary, the rabbi is here, and he's calling for you. Now, when Mary heard this, she got up to leave, and when the Jews who had come out from Jerusalem to console her saw her get up and leave, they assumed that she was returning to the tomb to anoint the body. So they got up and followed her. Now, when Mary got to the place where Jesus was, because he remained in the place where he was when he met Martha, she fell at his feet. Rabbi, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who had come to console her weeping, he was greatly moved in his spirit. He said, he said to the disciples, Show, show me where you have laid him. And then Jesus began to weep. Now, when the Jews saw him weeping, some of them said, see how he loved him. Others said, well, if he could open the eyes of the blind, he could have kept this man from dying. Now, they came to the tomb. It was a cave, and there was a large stone rolled in front of it. Jesus said to his disciples, roll away the stone. Martha said to him, Rabbi, my brother has been in this tomb for four days. There will be a very great odor. Jesus said to her, Martha, did I not tell you? that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. And then he prayed, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I am saying this on account of those who are standing near so that they may see the glory of God and believe. And then Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man 
wrapped in grave clothing with a grave cloth over his face came forth. And Jesus said to his disciples, unbind him and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. Some kind of story, isn't it? It's actually in the Bible. I didn't, I didn't fudge on anything. It's straight out of the Bible. You can look it up later, the 11th chapter of John, the first 45 verses. I, I, I don't remember when I hid that story in my heart, but I do know that from that day till this day, every time I think about it and say it aloud like I just did for you, it makes, it makes me love him all the more. And, and I want that experience for you. I, I won't take a lot of time, but I'm going to take enough time just to point out for you the remarkable character of Jesus and why it is we ought to love him. And here, here's the first reason. We ought to love him because his timing is perfect. He's always in the right place at the right time. Now, I'll be the first to admit that on our side of the equation, it doesn't always seem like he's in the right place at the right time, but he is. There's something interesting going on in the backstory of this that I'd like to tell you about. In the ancient world, among the Jews, there was a particular set practice for burial. The whole practice was called Ave Lu. You can forget that. The first three days of Ave Lu were called Anenu, three days, 72 hours. And during that time period, from the time a person died until the time that they were buried, the, those who have loved and lost were freed from all restraints of the law, and their only assignment was to grieve. Just get it out of your heart and grieve. And that's exactly where they are right now. They're weeping and gnashing teeth. They're heart sick. And Jesus doesn't come to them until the fourth day. Why the fourth day? Because the fourth day is the first day of seven days called Shiva or sitting Shiva. It's the time when those who have loved and lost will receive guests who will sympathize with them, who will console them in their brokenheartedness. Now, you just learned something about Jesus. Jesus was playing by the rules. He didn't come immediately. Remember, he said, this sickness does not lead to death, so he and his disciples remained where they were for two more days. Why did he wait two more days? So that he could arrive at Bethany on the fourth day, so that he could show himself to be what the scriptures of the Old Testament said he was, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, or like another writer in the New Testament says, he sympathizes with us in our weakness, being tempted as we, yet without sinning. I love that about Jesus. He is sympathetic to his core. And by the way, he'll be sympathetic with you. So the next time that you're feeling really bad about yourself, really bad about something you've done or not done or something you've said or didn't say, remember this. Jesus isn't angry at you. He's sympathetic with you. He'll come to you. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. I love the fact that Jesus Christ, I love the fact that his skin is thick and you can tell him anything you want just the way you want to say it. What did you make of this interesting interchange between Martha and Jesus? Martha comes and runs to him. Her heart is broken, and she's angry. And she says to Jesus, if you would have been here, none of this would have happened. Now, I'm thinking to myself, whoa, Martha, take it easy. This is Jesus, the Son of God. If he wants, he can strike you dead with a lightning bolt. He can send a thousand angels to come and tear you apart. Be a little kinder and gentler with him. If you would have been here, none of this would have happened. And Jesus takes it because his skin is thick and he can, 
You can tell him anything just the way you want to say it. Anybody here ever heard of the Psalms of Lament? There are some Psalms in the Bible whose purposes are there just to give us a pressure valve. And we can say the things that are in the Psalms. So see if anybody ever heard of this verse. I'll bet you you won't call this one your favorite verse in the Bible. It's the last verse in Psalm 137. The psalmist writes, Happy will they be who dash your baby's heads against the rocks. That's in the Bible. It's absolutely in the Bible. And why is it in the Bible? Well, I, I once asked Eugene Peterson that question. Eugene Peterson has been a, a close friend and a mentor for three decades. And I once said, Eugene, what's that doing in the Bible? What are you supposed to do with that when you preach it? To which he said, it's in the Bible because it's in the human heart. And if you leash, unleash this in the wrong place, somebody's going to get hurt. The only proper place to unleash your anger with God is in the presence of God. It's right here. If you would have been here, none of this would have happened. I know, I know, I know you're brokenhearted, but I'm going to do something about this, Martha. Believe me, I am. So here's my takeaway on that. Don't, don't, don't bundle up your pains and angers, the injustices that you have felt done to you. Don't, don't hold them in. Let them out. But let them out right here in the right place, in the presence of God. That's the second thing. I, I just love that about Jesus. There's no need to dress up in his presence. No need to fake it. Just say it. Here's the third thing I love about him. I love the fact that he is so sympathetic. He's got such a tender heart. Isn't this amazing? Martha comes to Mary and says, Mary, the rabbi is here, and he's calling for you. Mary gets up. Now, we're told that when the Jews who were with there, with him, saw her get up, they assumed she was going to the tomb to anoint the body or to weep. So they got up to join her. When Mary gets to Jesus, she falls on her face before him and weeps, saying, Rabbi, if you would have been here, my brother would not have been here, would not have died. Martha was angry. Mary was just brokenhearted. And we're told specifically in the biblical text that when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who had come to console her weeping, he was greatly moved in his spirit. And then he said, show me where you have laid him. And then Jesus begins to weep. I love the fact that Jesus weeps over us. Okay, so here's the fourth thing that I love about Jesus. I love the fact, I love the fact that he can do something about it. I mean, Jesus is amazing. So they come to the tomb. There's a big stone over it. And Jesus says, roll away the stone. Martha said, this is a very bad idea, Jesus. He's been in there for four days. It's an incredible order. Jesus said, Martha, I told you, if you believed, you would see the glory of God. Now roll away the stone. And they rolled away the stone. And then Jesus looked into the inky blackness of the tomb and he's about to call out Lazarus' name and I'm thinking to myself, the disciples standing near are mumbling to themselves, don't, don't do this, Jesus, don't do this. This is a bridge too far. Okay, you walked on water, that was cool. You fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes, that was amazing. But this is a dead man. You can't raise a dead man. Stop. But Jesus didn't stop. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And wonder of wonders, the dead man, every cell that had cooled, every gene and instinct that had withered, every finger that had gone hard, softened, loosened, and he got out of the grave Alive, Jesus Christ raises the dead. 
Jesus Christ raises the dead. Jesus Christ raises the dead. I was, I was kind of thinking someone was going to say amen. <laughs> Jesus Christ raises the dead. Is there anything dead in your life? Anything on life support? Anything cooling, moving toward death? Jesus Christ can do something about it. Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man, wrapped in grave clothes, came out of the grave. He said to his disciples, unbind him and let him go. I actually always think that part's a little bit nuts. I mean, you just made a guy come to life. Can't you unbind him yourself? Well, of course he could do that, but he didn't want to steal all the thunder. He wanted to let his disciples participate. He knew that he was only going to be here so many years, and then they would have to take his place saying, unbind him and let him go. He wanted them to practice a little bit before he left. I love that about Jesus too. But mostly I love the fact that Jesus Christ can do something with the dead things in our lives. Thank you very much, because I'm thinking that there may be some here with a few dead things, a few roadkill symbols in your life, a carcass here or there. It doesn't, it, honestly, it doesn't have to be that way. It does not have to be that way. Jesus Christ can make all things new. Do you, do you know the name of C.S. Lewis? I mean, he was a great writer in the early part of the 20th century. He wrote Mere Christianity. You, maybe, you, maybe you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, he also wrote another book called Surprised by Joy, in which he said this, Jesus Christ can make the feeblest and the filthiest of us into dazzling, rippling, immortal creatures, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love, which we now can scarcely imagine. The process will be long and at times painful, but that's what we're in for. That's what he said, and he meant it. I love Jesus. I, does this make you want to love him too? Okay, I, I, I'll wrap this up. I promised Eric I wouldn't go on as long as a seminary professor normally would go on. But I want you to come with me to Hope College, to Dimnit Chapel. So I've been a teacher at the seminary now since just after the Civil War. It's been a long, <laughs> a long haul. Now, I've, I've been there now for 23 years. Somewhere in the middle of that 23-year period, Hope College bought half of my time so that I could be the dean of the chapel by night and the professor of preaching by day. Now, when you're the dean of the chapel at Hope College, uh, your big ticket item, your big assignment is to preach at the gathering on Sunday night. The gathering, it, a thousand college kids jam their way into old dimnit chapel that only holds about 850 or 900 people. I mean, there are students hanging on the rafters there's loud rock and roll music that'll deafen your ears. And, and then an angel of the Lord stands up and preaches a sermon, and not a sermonette, a sermon. 45, 50 minutes of sermon. And then when the sermon is done, everyone is invited to come forward and eat the body and blood of Jesus. Communion, it's right there in front of you. The body was broken for you, the Blood was poured out for you. And then after that, if you wish, you can come up on the platform where there are teams of people poised to pray for you. Whatever need you have, they'll pray for you. Now, during my four-year tenure as dean of the chapel, one of my students from the seminary would come and worship in the gathering just to hear his professor preach. Well, actually, it was for more than that. And he wasn't just a normal student. He was an extraordinary student. His name, Stephen Kazimba. And he sounds like his name. He's African, Ugandan, six foot something else, long, tawny fin fingers, skin black as midnight and beautiful and a holy man. How holy is Stephen Kazimba, someone asks me? I'll tell you how holy he is. 
all the other students in seminary would refer to him as father. They just admired him. I've been to Uganda many times to be with him. He is a remarkable guy. Well, anyway, Stephen Kazimba would come, and he would sit over there against the wall while the band played, and I would preach just so he could lift me up while I preached. So on this particular occasion, people are coming forward. I'm over here praying with somebody. A group of students are over there praying with a young woman who, in the middle of their prayers for her, begins to tremble uncontrollably. Her eyes roll in the back of her head, and she just falls over. They were immediately frightened, and they thought she was possessed by a demon. Knowing that they're in over their head, they ran for me. I immediately knew I was in over my head, so I ran for Kazimba. <laughs> I said, Stephen, come with me. We came, and there she was shaking. We probably should have called 911, but our instincts told us there was something else going on. We knelt down, prayed for her. She seemed to quiet a little bit, and then Kazimba stood up, and I stood up with him, and he said to me, this is not a demon. I said, Kazimba, what is it? He said, she has a besetting sin. Now, I wasn't sure what a besetting sin was. Are you? A besetting sin is a very deep darkness that you hold tight as a lug nut on a fire hydrant, deep in your soul. You won't let anybody know about it. It never sees the light of day. It just begins to corrode like toxic waste until it burns a hole in your soul and you can't hold it. That night with the gospel being preached, the body and blood of Jesus on display, she couldn't hold it anymore. Wow. A besetting sin, all right. Four years previously, as a junior in high school, she got involved with her boyfriend, too, too involved in all the wrong ways. She woke up one day and realized she was pregnant. She was so frightened. What am I going to do? So she did the one thing she shouldn't have done with only the knowledge of her best friend and her boyfriend. She drove out of town under the cover of darkness to a place where she had an abortion. She thought to herself, there, it's behind me. But nah, it wasn't behind her. It was now it was deep within her. And that night, she could hold it no longer. Then Kazimba knelt back down. He laid hands on her again. He said something to her I couldn't quite hear. And then she turned and said something to him. And then she got up and Kazimba helped her up and they, they walked out of the chapel together into a much different future. Would you like to know what Kazimba said to her? He knelt down and laid hands on her and said, little one, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, when Kazimba said that to her, she turned and said something to him. You want to know what she said? She looked at Kazimba and said, really? <laughs> Kazimba said, yes, little one, really. And then they walked into a brand new future. See, go ahead, let it up for the Lord. See, I am making all things new. Whatever you're carrying like a ball and chain, honestly, you don't have to carry it another minute because I make all things new. Eric, thanks for letting me come and tell your people that. Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus Christ, 
it's really clear there's nobody like you. You get right in the face of the evil one and tell him to take a hike. You stand at the roadkill of our lives and make it come alive again. Amazing how we love you for this and how we want to have the courage to pick up and to move on into the new life of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us and in whose name we pray, amen. This is what we know. We know that there are sins in our life that seek to define us and tell us who we are. But there is a Savior who shed his blood to tell us who we are in him. So if you're in this place today and you find yourself like that young woman with something that has owned you deep inside, here's my invitation. Come down. Let's pray. We're not uncomfortable to come to Jesus in this place. If you don't know him as your Savior, come down. Right after the service, we'll pray with you. If you have something that's owned you for too long, come down. We'll pray with you. Because by the blood of Christ, you are not owned by who you were. You are called by a new name. You are a Christian. By the blood of Christ, your life is owned by him. So don't leave this place if there is something you've hidden for too long. One of my favorite things about hearing Pastor Tim Brown teach through my years of seminary was that it applied in one way all the time. Come to Jesus. He is worth loving because he has proven how much he loved us. Come to Jesus. And that's my invitation to you today. If you don't know him, come to Jesus. If you need him, come to Jesus. Let's not pretend that we've got it together. Let's pretend that he's calling us, not pretend. Let's live like he is calling us to himself. As you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building. My friends, you are dismissed.